Uh, good evening, everybody. At the onset, I would definitely like to thank Dr. Mayur and his entire team for making me a part of this fantastic meeting. It is with great regret that I am unable to join virtually at the end of this uh, conversation we have with each other, but I have not been able to do it due to prior constraints. And today I am going to be talking about a very, very interesting topic. And the reason I'm saying very, very interesting topic, because I think we are increasingly beginning to realize the relevance of two very important markers in clinical practice as far as reproductive endocrinology goes. AMH, that is anti-mullerian hormone, and inhibin B. And before I get to as to what exactly is the role of AMH and inhibin B in clinical practice, what do we actually mean by AMH and inhibin B? These are actually dimeric glycoproteins consisting of two identical 70 kilo Dalton subunits and constitute the transforming growth factor beta superfamily together with inhibins, activins, bone morphogenetic proteins and growth differentiation factors play an important role in many biological processes. And today what we are going to be discussing in all these biological processes are actually folliculogenesis and spermatogenesis. You know, when you look at males, what you realize is that in early infancy, serum concentrations of inhibin B, as you can see in this chart, rise to supra-adult levels. And these elevated concentrations actually persist for longer than the postnatal rises in FSH, LH, and testosterone, which fall by six to nine months of age to very low concentrations that then persist throughout childhood. This neonatal increase in NMB concentrations actually may reflect the increase in the number of Sertoli cells which occur at this point of time. Now, after this quiescent period of childhood that you see over here, you would realize that puberty is associated again with an increase in the blood levels of inhibin B. Initially, mind you, this increase is associated positively with FSH levels in the blood. But at a later stage, which is not actually very clearly defined, there's a switch. to so there's an inverse relationship between the blood levels of FSH and inhibin B, which is actually characteristic what is seen in the adult human male. And that's why inhibin B potentially is a very useful indicator of spermatogenesis and Sertoli cell function in adults when AMH may no longer be measurable. Now, when you look at AMH, on the other hand, what do you see? AMH, mind you, as we know, is the anti mullerian hormone. It is secreted by the immature Sertoli cells and its concentration before puberty is extremely high. But as puberty progresses, these immature Sertoli cells differentiate to mature Sertoli cells. And as you can see in the green line over here, the AMH levels then drop significantly. Now, because AMH is actually a functional marker of immature Sertoli cells, it is possible that higher AMH levels in early life will lead to increased support by mature Sertoli cells of germ cells in adulthood. This is the pattern which is actually seen in males as far as inhibin B and AMH is concerned. Now, what about, and as I said, what actually happens is that inhibin B inhibits, has an inhibitory effect. It almost has a negative feedback effect on the hypothalamus and the LH and FSH secretion by the pituitary. So when you look at the pituitary hormone effects, you know LH FSH stimulates spermatogenesis and testosterone secretion by the testes. The Sertoli cells facilitate this spermatogenesis. But once some spermatogenesis crosses a certain threshold, your inhibin B levels are actually going to have a negative inhibitory influence on the FSH and very, very tightly control the entire process of spermatogenesis. Now, when you look at your female patients, what do you see? What is it that you will see as far as the reproductive cycle goes? What you realize is that inhibin B is produced by the granulosa cells of small as well as large antral follicles over here. If you see over here, you would realize the small and large antral follicles are what are producing inhibin B. 
Now, both estradiol as well as inhibin B again will go into inhibit pituitary FSH secretion. So again, it has a negative feedback mechanism. Now, as the size of the follicle pool declines, inhibin B levels, mind you, fall. And what we need to realize is the FSH levels rise. So that basically reflects a loss of this inhibin restraint. What is important and what has implications for us in clinical practice is that inhibit levels, mind you, change within the menstrual cycle. So you will have inhibit levels actually peaking in the early to mid follicular phase. And there is going to be a secondary peak at the time of ovulation. And this is important for us because this has implications when we are evaluating the inhibin B levels in our patients. Now, what about AMH? AMH, we all know, is secreted by the small preantral, the large preantral follicles, and actually it is first secreted by the fetal germ cells at 36 gestational weeks. And at birth, mind you, the levels of AMH are approximately 1.6 nanogram per ml. This then subsequently continuously rises to about 10 years of age. It peaks in adolescence. And then, as we all know, there's a decline after the age of 18 years until menopause. What is very important for us to also realize and understand is, again, AMH is having a feedback inhibition of FSH at two levels. Firstly, most importantly, it inhibits recruitment of these primordial follicles into the growing pool. And Secondly, it reduces the sensitivity of antral follicles to FSH, which is a feedback mechanism of AMH and FSH after menarche. And what that translates for you and me means that AMH is actually going to control the recruitment mechanism of these primordial follicles to primary follicles. And that is how it regulates the reproductive lifespan. And a high level of AMH actually during adolescence may be a predictor for natural fertility and reproductive lifespan. And why are we talking about all this? We are talking about all this because we all know at the end of the day, when you are talking about the effect of hormones, when you are talking about the if effect of all these different parameters during a patient planning pregnancy, either a male or female, it has a number of implications for the patient. Now, when you look, how do you actually define, if I just talk in terms of, you know, defining fertility, what do you say? You talk in terms of fertility as, if I define it very simply, as the natural capacity of a couple to establish a clinical pregnancy. And in this entire process, there are going to be a number of factors which are going to influence the quantity and quality of oocytes or spermatozoa, as well as factors which are going to affect the process of fertilization, embryo implantation. And in females, the most important factor which actually influences fertility is ovarian aging. And what we know very well, that there is an age-related decline in ovarian function, which is related to the gradual loss of primordial follicles when follicular atresia takes place. And importantly, follicular atresia is a GN-independent process that starts before birth. And actually, the function of AMH, mind you, is to slow the recruitment of these primordial follicles so that the high levels of AMH that we see at puberty actually may be responsible for the decreased rate of follicular atresia that you are seeing so that both AMH and primordial follicles decrease with age after sexual maturation, which indicates that AMH is actually a marker of ovarian aging. Now, when I am talking about ovarian aging and I am talking about in which situations we need to be testing ovarian reserve, reserve, the indications have really widened. The indications are widened because we as a society have changed increasingly. We now have our patients opting for pregnancies much later than it, what was done maybe a decade or two decades earlier. So there are going to be different situations now than what we saw initially. 
Now, when you're talking about indications for ovarian reserve testing, it could be women undergoing infertility evaluation or treatment, which is the most common area where ovarian reserve testing is done. It could be individualization for assisted reproductive technology, ovarian stimulation protocol and dosing, which again is very, very important. History of premature ovarian failure or early menopause. It could be in PCOS. It could be in perimenopause because as I said, as our patients opt for pregnancies much later in life, we are going to have situations where our patients also want to know as to when they are going to attain menopause. Women with BRCA1 or FMR1 pre-mutations are another, are another group of patients where we do opt for ovarian reserve testing. A number of patients now are talking in terms of elective freezing of eggs where they are not prepared for a pregnancy at a particular point of time and may want to opt for it at a later point of time. Oocyte donors, we are going to check ovarian reserve. Fertility preservation before and after gonadotoxic treatment. As we know, a number of our cancer survivor patients do plan pregnancies and do want to know the reproductive potential before and after therapy. And of course, preoperative prior to ovarian surgery in the reproductive age group, as well as diagnosis and recurrent surveillance for granulosa cell tumors. So you have the indications are widened. And when the indications widen, our skills, our ways of being able to actually assess ovarian reserve also need to improve. When we talk about conventional tests, we have always spoken about FSH. You and me have been very comfortable with using a day three FSH and always accept that an FSH more than 10 indicates a reduced reserve. We also talk in terms of using a combination of tests. It could be FSH with estradiol or inhibin B levels. Ovarian volume measurement has what is what is being has all been used and over in antral follicle measurement, as we all know, the AFC count has been used very, very commonly when we are talking in terms of assessing ovarian reserve estimation. Now, where does AMH come in this entire story? The advantage of AMH, mind you, friends, is that it is a robust measurement, not significantly influenced by a number of variables which normally influence the menstrual cycle or the reproductive cycles. And most importantly, when you look at the AMH levels in menstrual cycles, there's no real cyclic variation in the AMH levels. You would realize when you look at this graph over here, it is relatively quite a stable level throughout pregnancy, uh, sorry, throughout the menstrual cycle. And that gives you a big advantage when you are evaluating AMH levels in the menstrual cycle. As I've already spoken about in great detail, because I thought it was very relevant when we're talking about AMH expression and ovarian reserve, this is how AMH is expressed. And AMH is actually a very, very close reflection of the ovarian reserve, which gradually reduces as you grow older. Now, when we look at AMH and ovarian failure, what do you see? When you look at it as a marker of premature, ov premature ovarian insufficiency, yes, it is a good marker because it has a low susceptibility to the effect by HRT. It can predict the transient or permanent state. And though there is some evidence in literature which says that some of the HRTs can influence AMH markers, you can potentially stop the HRT and then evaluate the AMH to have a more accurate reflection of what is the ovarian reserve. When you are looking at iatrogenic ovarian failure, be it post chemotherapy or radiotherapy, we are looking at AMH levels before and after chemo or radiotherapy because of high AH, AMH level before chemo radiotherapy would be a more better reflection of whether your patient is going to have what kind of reproductive capacity post chemo radiotherapy or whether this patient is going to continue with their menstrual cycles or they are going to be potentially aminoric post therapy. And it also helps us understand better as to which drugs, it helps the oncologist understand which drugs could potentially be used more intelligently. For example, we know that certain drugs like cyclophosphamide and melphalan have a high ovarian toxicity. 
vis-a-vis vincristine, bleomycin, and methotrexate, which have a low ovarian toxicity. And it really helps your oncologists make a much better decision as to which drug potentially they could use in a patient, especially if a patient is very keen on having ovarian functions post chemotherapy or radiotherapy, where it is very important for the patient. There are also situations like this where if the AMH levels are not commensurate for a patient to possibly undergo chemo or radio and plan a pregnancy where you freeze the eggs prior to the procedure so that the patient can then at some point of time plan a pregnancy subsequently. PCOS. PCOS, you realize that, you know, the theory about AMH and PCOS has raised a lot of, I would say, excitement, a lot of ripples, because it is believed that the AMH receptor, which is expressed in the hypothalamic GN-releasing hormone-producing neurons, is actually regulating the HPG axis and is actually responsible for the excessive androgens. We all know the AMH levels are higher in PCOS patients, and this actually is going to inhibit the recruitment of primary follicles from the primordial pool and has fewer growing follicles. The follicles don't really grow, but you have more two to six millimeter non-growing follicles. And we also know that because of these elevated serum AMH levels, there's going to be a later age at menopause compared to women without PCOS. A lot of new data as far as AMH and PCOS goes regarding whether this patient put, when you are stimulating the patient, especially when you're doing ART, and whether you're stimulating the patient, whether this patient is going to have a hyperstimulation syndrome, whether this patient is going to respond well to therapy, the, the AMH along with inhibin B and FSH is used in conjunction to understand which patient is of your PCOS is going to respond better to indu induction therapy, for example, with clomiphene citrate, or any one of the other ovulation induction regimens. Now, when you look at AMH infertility, which is the area where AMH is used the most, what do you see? When you look at fertility, as I said, there are two things which matter, your quality. And as we all know, the oocyte quality is determined to a significant extent by age. And quantity, which is a surrogate marker of the reflection of the quantity is AMH. So AMH is actually going to predict the probability of conception, the oocyte yield. It can serve as a fertility test before marriage. You have, I increasingly see a number of young patients coming to me and asking me, Madam, can we please check whether I am fertile, whether I will have any problems after marriage? I mean, we now have patients coming to us preconception and asking for these tests and asking to be evaluated whether they are going to have any problems post-marriage. I have questions like, ma'am, how late can I delay my pregnancy? Ma'am, is it okay if I just freeze my eggs and plan a pregnancy later? So you are having increasingly a patient population which has different demands, a patient population which has different ideas about how they want to lead their lives. And as a clinician, we need to help them do it to the best of our ability. As I said, it also predicts OHSS and also excessive response to FSH, for example, an AMH more than three, which we often see in our PCO patients. Poor responders to FSH are also based on AMH levels, for example, an AMH level less than one. And you may also select the initial FHS dose based on the AMH. But I would also like to put a caveat over here that please do not base your entire decision on the AMH level. You often see in clinical practice that they may actually sometimes be a complete disjunct between what the AMH levels say and the patients do come back to you with pregnancy, with very, very successful pregnancies. So I always say that, yes, you AMH levels are a good reflection of your ovarian reserve. But at the same time, we do know in clinical practice, there can be situations where your patients with a low AMH level would still come to you back with pregnancies. So when you advise your patients, depending on age and AMH, what would you advise them? For example, if the AH is more than three, but the age is less than 38, you would suggest IVF, but there's an increased risk of OHSS. If the age is more than 38 years with an AMH of more than three, 
less frequent in occurrence, but better outcomes are expected. If the AMH is between 1 to 2.9 and age is less than 38, you're expecting a healthy yield and a very, very optimal outcome. But with the same AMH, if your age is more than 38, you're expecting low pregnancy potential and IVF may be tried. Less than one, as we've been saying, modest or low yield or may require more cycles. And of course, if the patient is more than 38, you would discuss alternate options with the patient as far as fertility goes. As I said, when you're talking about fertility, patients are also asking you, ma'am, when will I go into menopause? And this is important because low levels actually come on almost five years prior to actual menopause. And you can really predict the age in 20 to 49 years old. And I think in certain situations, it does prepare your patients better for menopause. Coming to male fertility, you would think I've completely forgotten about male fertility. If you look at AMH levels in disorders of male fertility, I'm not going to go into the DSD disorders in the end because time does not permit me to cover that entire framework. So what I am going to be talking about AMH levels, briefly run through it as to what implications it has as far as male fertility goes. You would realize that when you're looking at pubertal delay, there will be a normal prepubertal level in puberty. And it would actually, there's a lot of data which show that AMH levels do help you differentiate between hypo, hypo and your congenital, your CDGP. So you are increasingly using it to differentiate these disorders. When you look at severe congenital hypo, hypo, you would realize that there's a decrease in puberty. Kleinfelter syndrome, with it will be within the reference range until puberty. A puberty-related decline, will there be a delay in that? And thereafter, declines to subnormal concentrations in adults. Non-obstructive azospermia is an area where it is increasingly used and you find decreased AMH levels. Varicoceles, it is elevated in early onset varicoceles in prepubertal and pubertal boys, but decrease in adults with severe varicocele. And it is increased in boys with McCune Albright, Albright syndrome, but in male senescence, you are expecting an age-related decrease in AMH levels. When you talk about NOA, which is a severe form of male infertility, where you talk in terms of using my, a T, a TSC or micro TSC, because that is the way you would actually offer fertility to your patient, there is no reliable biochemical marker really, but because AMH has a paracaine control of Leydig cell function, this ratio, the elevated AMH and AMH-TT ratio does tell you there's a depleted germ cell reservoir. And if the AMH is more than 4.6, it may you may need to rethink about your decision about any kind of surgical intervention. You may need to rethink about your decision about doing a micro TSE because in these patients, you would not have good outcomes. Now, when I talk about inhibin B, we all know inhibin B correlates with sperm concentration in men with normal and impaired spermatogenesis, correlates positively with sperm count and testicular volume, and serum inhibin B and FSH are inversely correlated. In females, on the other hand, it is again a good surrogate measure of follicle health and viability. If your day three inhibin B is reduced, it means that there is a declining ovarian reserve and this patient is not going to do very well with ovulation stimulation. High levels of follicular fluid inhibin A and B levels do correlate with better pregnancy rates and better ovarian response in patients undergoing hormonal stimulation for oocyte retrieval. Now, when we look at high, very high AMH levels, what do they tell us? A, it could be just a reflection of ovarian hypothecosis. B, they may precede tumors like granulosa cell tumors of the ovary. It can also have a direct correlation with the tumor size. Mind you, it also predicts recurrence of tumor. And of course, it also talks, tells you the success of ovarian, ovarian transplantation in fertility preservation. Some of the downsides when you're using parameters like AMH is the, in, there's a significant individual variability, which can sometimes be more than 100-fold. As I said, you can predict fertilization, you can predict blastulation, you can predict even maybe miscarriages, but not live birth rate. 
there's lack of standardization in the assay and there's also an ethnic variability and all this holds true even for your inhibin B levels and to add to it you also need to be careful when you are checking your inhibin B levels of your patient because you need to check it as I said in the earlier phase of your menstrual cycle. So if I summarize in clinical practice definite marker of ovarian reserve. Very, very important roles now being seen in PCOS, DSD, and menopause. So very important area of expertise is going to come up in these areas. Possibly in pubertal disorders, tumors, definite role, I would still say, in ART protocols. And of course, the future is AMH analogs, which at this point of time, I have shot, overshot time a little. I will not get into the details. Thank you very, very much for your patient listening. Really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And once again, thanks to the organizers.